Thank you, Michael. Uh, on the behalf of Paros, um, we are very happy to be here with you at uh, Bluetech Global uh, Connect. Uh, Sparrows, uh, we have been tailoring Aquafeed since uh, 2008. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Luis Conceição, as you mentioned, and I am a co-founder and uh, CEO at Sparrows. Uh, next. So we like to think of ourselves as a science and technology driven company, which dedicates itself to develop uh, new products and uh, tailored solutions for the Aquafeed market, so, so our keywords are uh, aquaculture and uh, nutrition. Next slide, please. We have a pilot scale feed meal for the production of aquafeeds in the south of Portugal, in uh, Olhão. Uh, and uh, we also perform uh, nutritional trials with uh, fish and shrimp. These are our initial core activities. Uh, next. Uh, we have grown uh, over the years in number of people. We are at the moment uh, 22 employees uh, uh, plus uh, four uh, PhD students which are uh, joining us uh, during their, uh, their PhD. So we like to think that uh, young talent is our uh, most valuable asset. Next slide, please. And uh, if we talk about our business, uh, as I said, we started uh, by producing uh, custom-made uh, R&D aquafeeds and performing uh, in vivo nutritional trials with fish and shrimp. So that's our uh, what we call our uh, industrial services or research uh, services, which we provide uh, essentially to the aquafeed value chain and also to some uh, fish farms. And uh, over the years, through R&D projects, we have developed, developed uh, two ranges of uh, products. Um, one dedicated to the aquaculture market, the hatchery feeds, which basically we produce micro diets to feed uh, um, larvae and uh, young juveniles of fish, at the, especially at marine aquaculture hatcheries, but also some freshwater ones. And also, we have also developed a product targeted to the bi biomedical market and basically to people doing research on uh, zebrafish, which is the second most used uh, model for biomedical research. And this is what we call the zebra feed, our standard feed for the uh, zebrafish. And uh, more recently, we have uh, developed a range of nutritional tools based on IT technologies. Um, we have two products there, the Feednetics and the feed, uh, Feeding Tables. Today I will spend the rest of the presentation uh, dedicate, uh, dedicated to Feednetics, which is our, uh, our major uh, interest now to promote. Next slide, please. So when we think about uh, aquaculture, uh, I mean, we know that aquaculture has uh, several uh, sustainability challenges. And for us, uh, sustain sustainability in relation to aquaculture, it's a keyword, not a, buzz not a buzzword. And we know that the challenges include the biological aspects, uh, some environmental impact uh, issues, which are very important to be dealt with. There are consumer perception uh, issues. There is uh, occupation of coastal areas. With the feednetics, we are talking mostly about uh, helping to solve the biological and uh, environmental aspects of, uh, of aquaculture sustainability. And for us, basically, all these uh, challenges uh, for aquaculture, for us, they're also seen as business opportunities. Next. Uh, going to the background of uh, feednetics, so the problem that we are uh, addressing is uh, feeding optimization, so how to feed the fish in um, in fish cages or ponds in an effective way which uh, leads to maximum production and uh, lowest possible environmental impact and uh, of course this is a very important uh, question both from the economical and also from the environmental point of view uh, one of them in, in term economical terms we know that feed costs represent typically from 50 to 70% of the running production costs of a fish farm. And uh, we know that uh, most of the feeding strategies which are used in fish farms, they are still developed based on trial and error uh, um, experience. So basically empirism. And uh, we know that often this leads to suboptimal uh, values, uh, which lead to lower performance and fish health and what could be 
attained and also to higher environment, environmental impacts that what would be needed. Okay, and so we hope that phenetics can help that in terms of uh, fish farms, uh, but also for uh, aquafeed companies, we believe that this can uh, help to 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 sustain the the R and D efforts of uh, aquafeed companies by making them more efficient because i mean the aquafit company typically they have to address uh, several species for each species they have to address many variables in terms of nutrition uh, they are proteins fatty acids amino acids vitamins minerals that they have to deal with in, in their feed ingredient uh, different types of ingredients uh, and so on and also sometimes r and efforts they are focused on uh, short-term uh, assessment uh, wh while i mean farming is a long-term uh, uh, effort so we we think phenetics can also help in this endeavor and um, and then the other part, uh, the other uh, question is that for aquifeed performance depends a lot on uh, farm conditions so the feeding uh, regimes and the, even the feed the optimal feed will depend from one farm to the to the other and based on their uh, temperature for instance and, and other conditions next slide please so uh, our solution, so it's the feednetics uh, prediction tools uh, where the users can optimize feeding strategies and get the real time estimates of uh, what will happen if, so if you change feed quantity or feed composition. And so basically using this tool, you can make estimates in a couple of hours, you can make estimates for, uh, for, um, for uh, how the fish will perform in months or even years. So the, the, the final objective is to increase the profits by savings on feed while keeping the environmental impact to a reasonable uh, uh, value. Uh, it, it's also a fair management tool, so you can, it can help you to plan uh, harvest dates by getting accurate predictions. And overall, it's a knowledge generation tool which you, with which you can also benchmark your production data. Next slide, please. So the, the core of Feednetics is a state-of-the-art uh, mathematical model uh, where, uh, where uh, what you have to, the data you have to enter, the inputs, let's say, are the, the feed composition, the feed quantity, and also the water temperature a long time. You have to give these inputs a long time. So if you want to make a prediction for one year, you have to have predictions of what will be the temperature for that coming year and also the quantities of feed that you will use and the types of feed that you will use. And once you feed this into Feednetics interface, you can get uh, predictions of growth, but also the fish composition. And, um, and also you can get, of course, economic uh, data, the economic conversion data of the feed the feeding costs, uh, predictions of the waste output, both, for instance, in terms of phosphorus and nitrogen, but you can also predict what will be the oxygen consumption and the CO2 and ammonia excretions to the environment. The difference between uh, Feednetics and other uh, models that exist is that Feednetics is quite uh, detailed. It goes to the level of amino acids and fatty acids for the ones who are aware with, um, with, uh, with, uh, with nutrition. And uh, what is also distinctive is that Feednetics, we have uh, worked very hard to develop a user-friendly and flexible interface, so a software, uh, which translates the, the, the model, mathematical model or the algorithm into something which is easier for people to use, uh, to use on a daily basis. Next, please. So the Feednetics uh, prediction tool, it's the, the result. And uh, we believe this can be a very useful tool, both for fish farmers and for aquifeed uh, companies. Next, please. So uh, we are commercializing Feednetics in three different ways. Uh, one is a web uh, app license where people can run their own uh, simulations. And this is based on an annual fee. Uh, we can also run the simulations for you if you, if you are just using it uh, from time to time. You don't have uh, regular use of the, of the software. And then you pay per service. So you run the simulations, you get the report. And also, we are also working hard with other companies to, to have an uh, operation service meaning that you can integrate feednetics with the farm management the fish farm management uh, software and uh, the, at the moment uh, feednetics is uh, being uh, can be used for uh, guilt at and uh, european cbas 
two species typically found in the south of Europe, and also for rainbow trout, which, which has a more wide uh, distribution, and tilapia and, uh, and Atlantic salmon will come uh, next. But we can also perform custom calibrations for other species. That's also a possibility. Next slide, please. Just uh, how does Fitnetics compare with the competition? Basically, basically we can see that uh, Fitnetics um, goes to a high level of detail in terms of simulating the fish uh, nutrition. Uh, the competition has variable levels of uh, of um, of detail and but uh, limitation typical the these softwares which exist they are made by feed companies and they are restricted to be used with their own feeds so basically they cannot be used to benchmark feeds from different companies with Finet Finetics, this is becomes possible next slide please just uh, a quick overview of the of, of the aquaculture market so we are talking about a market which yearly moves around 100 million euros or about the same in dollars and uh, and the good news is that uh, production tends to grow aquaculture is the fastest growing uh, animal production sector and uh, also the industry is eager to absorb technology the the aquaculture industrialization is underway and the aquaculture 4.0 is more and more a reality next slide please so if you look at the UN Sustainable Goals, we believe that Fidnetic is strongly linked to goal 14, life below water, but also will contribute to goals 9 and 2. Next slide, please. And uh, how are we commercializing uh, Fidnetics? I mean, with direct sales through our team. We have a team of uh, four persons working with Fidnetics at the moment. And uh, but we also want to promote promote indirect sales through integration with other software like the farm management software as I mentioned. But we also want to find the distributors and sales representatives for uh, especially for areas outside uh, Europe, regions outside Europe. Next slide, please. And actually, this is what we are looking for and why we are here with you today, hoping that some of you at least can help us with that. And uh, next, please. So I will just want to thank you for your, uh, your attention and I'll be available for the question and answers and you can, back to, uh, can get back to us on uh, my email or visit our website. Thank you very much. Luis, thank you very much. <clears throat> very interesting presentation. Um, Folly, I'm going to ask you to leave my microphone open. Um, I need to kind of make sure that as we get close to the 10 minutes that I can give a warning. Uh, Luis went over. Um, so, Luis, great presentation. Hopefully people will want to talk to you and we will look forward to referring people your way in the future. Um, our next speaker will represent uh, Ocean Rain uh, uh, Forest. Uh, Eliza Harrison, Eliza, over to you. Thanks, Michael, and thanks for the entire Blue, entire Blue Tech Connect team for allowing us to be here um, this afternoon or morning. We are very excited to share a little bit about the work that we've done in the past in the Faroe Islands, as well as our most recent innovations in California. As Michael said, my name is Eliza Harrison. I work as the Business Development Co Coordinator for Ocean Rainforest, um, which is among the largest seaweed producers in the Western Hemisphere, but also recently became the co prime contractor for a three-year initiative led by the U.S. Department of Energy that is based in Santa Barbara, California. Next slide, please. Ocean Rainforest is a company that's been in the Faroe Islands for the past 10 years and has worked very actively to improve and understand um, sustainable cultivation techniques for offshore seaweed cultivation. The mission of our company, both in the Faroe Islands as well as in the United States, is to improve people, people's well-being and make a unique contribution to our blue planet by pursuing sustainable seaweed cultivation. Next slide, please. Through our work in the Faroe Islands, we've had an opportunity to craft a very diverse and skilled team in all variety of areas related to seaweed production in the seaweed value change. Chain. These include um, aquaculture engineers, entrepreneurial visionaries, processing experts, among a, a host of others. And with their support, we've been able to refine a number of aspects that are associated with traditional seaweed cultivation and production techniques. Over the course of the last decade, Ocean Rainforest has had the opportunity to iterate many times on structural um, 
and processing innovations based in the Faroe Islands, which has really laid the foundation for the company's new work in the, in the United States. Next slide, please. But before diving too deeply um, into our work as a company, I thought it would be helpful to give a bit, of a bit of an overview about seaweed. When we're talking about seaweed, we're generally referring to multicellular macroscopic, macroscopic marine algae, um, which fall into three different categories, red, green, and brown. For the purposes of our work in California and the presentation today, I'm going to primarily focus on Macrocystis periphera, which is also known as giant kelp. Giant kelp is one of the most ubiquitous organisms on the planet and actually has the capacity to grow up to 150 feet per day, or 150 feet long and up to two feet per day. Next slide, please. Traditionally, seaweed has been used in a variety of industries, but most, mostly in terms of hydrocolloids as well as for human food. In terms of the highest hydrocolloid industry, which is where most seaweed produced is currently directed, Seaweed is able to form a number of emulsifying or gelling agents. This means that seaweed is actually in, men, in many common household products, including shampoo, toothpaste, ice cream, and even the foam in some beers. Next slide, please. But in addition to these traditional applications, seaweed has a number of um, components and compounds that can be used to address new, new and sustainable industries, specifically in terms of biofuels, biodegradable plastics, as well as innovative textiles. The challenge though then becomes that the current scale of seaweed cultivation is able to be addressed or is it able to address the existing industry needs including um, um, hydrocolloids as well as human food. But as we look to invest and explore these new areas of research specifically around biofuels and these sustainable alternative productions of textiles, there is this need uh, to, develop, to develop a new and scalable cultivation system and way of mass producing seaweed in order to supply these new and developing industries. And so in recognizing this disconnect between the available supply and potential future demands, the U.S. Department of Energy became very recent, interested in spearheading the development of the U.S. seaweed aquaculture industry in 2017. Next slide, please. The ARPA-E Mariner program is an initiative or is it an agency within the U.S. Department of Energy that is specifically interested in biofuel production as well as sustainable animal feed that could come from large-scale seaweed cultivation. Under the project um, of the ARPA-E Mariner program, Ocean Rainforest has an opportunity to help lead what's called the Macro Systems Initiative, which is specifically designed to evaluate the feasibility of a new cultivation system. Other aspects of the ARPA-E Mariner program include evaluating including new investments in environmental monitoring techniques, aquatic model modeling tools, and advancing novel breeding and genetic tools. Next slide, please. Specifically for the Massacre Systems Project, Ocean Rainforest has an opportunity, in, with support from a number of international and local partners, to conduct a three-year demonstration project to test the feasibility of a cultivation system in order to ensure that the design we've proposed is scalable, sustainable, survivable, predictable, and profitable. By our work in, the, in California, we have an opportunity to demonstrate and make the business case for seaweed cultivation in the United States, which is extremely important, especially as we look to the future of aquaculture. Ultimately, should this uh, macro systems and the Mariner program be successful, we have an opportunity to help join and lead the world in terms of innovating and developing a new method of sustainable seaweed cultivation. Next slide, please. But in order to do this important work um, and to really make that investment and, and contribution to the larger global community, Ocean Rainforest and the Macrosystems team have developed a number of key experiments that will be associated with our work under the department, department's, um, department of Energy's funding program in order to demonstrate and really assess the pr um, production capacity and potential yield associated with our cultivation system. The experiments that we're looking to run include uh, optimization for seeding techniques, as well as ha now harvesting strategies, and finally assessing potentially optimal cultivation depths for the system that would be offshore in the federal waters in the United States. And as we do this exper these experiments, we are of course going to need a cultivation system um, to be able to form the basis of our work. Next slide. And so what you're seeing here is it first on the top image a lateral view of the cultivation system that we have proposed to install on an 86 acre demonstration project um, or permit for a demonstration project off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. The system consists of ropes, buoys, and anchors 
which allow it to be very, very dynamic and thus should be survivable in offshore conditions. The system is also in, in large, large part based off of a system that has been in the Faroe Islands and for the last 10 years has shown no meaningful damage. In the bottom image um, is, a, Im is the map showing where the um, proposed demonstration project will be in the Santa Barbara Channel, which is relevant um, for individuals who are potential stakeholders in the local community, which include fishermen as well as potential regulatory agencies. Next slide, please. But perhaps more importantly and, and generally um, in terms of the value of seaweed cultivation, um, ocean rainforests and the macrosystem steam are very, very interested in supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goals in three primary categories. Through seaweed cultivation, we actually have the opportunity of removing excess nutrients from the marine environment that stem in large part from overuse of agricultural fertilizers. Growing seaweed also removes meaningful amounts of carbon dioxide which can help not only reduce the effects of climate change, but also reduce the risk of ocean acidification, which is beneficial for calcifying organisms. And finally, cultivating seaweed in an offshore environment allows us to support the development of sustainable um, habitat for marine species that traditionally re rely on kelp forests for feeding grounds, nurseries, and other similar um, activities. Next slide, please. And aside from the environmental benefit, seaweed cultivation also stands to benefit the local community as a whole. In addition to providing new job sources and job opportunities, seaweed cultivation can actually support economic diversification as well by providing a new source of biomass for individuals in those communities to explore the many and varied applications of seaweed in everyday consumer products. Next slide, please. And with that, I would like to thank you all for letting me share a little bit about our work, first in the Faroe Islands and more recently in California. I look forward to being in touch. Thank you so much. Eliza, thank you very much. Great, uh, great presentation, great time management. And it's, you know, thank you so much for jumping in. Uh, there are so many incredible companies and, and uh, I'm sure if the Norwegians have been here, they would have been great. But it was wonderful to hear what you started in the Danish uh, Fair Islands and are doing now in the United States. So thank you for your presentation and your work. Uh, our third presenter before we go into the Q&A will be Greg Murphy uh, with Blue Nalo. So Greg, look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thanks, Michael, and thanks to team for this opportunity. I, I'm really excited to be with you today uh, to really chat about a new way to see food. Uh, Blue Nalu is a cellular aquaculture company in which we are producing real seafood products that consumers enjoy that are delicious, but in a completely different way, uh, using just the cells of the fish rather than growing the whole fish. So I'll go into a little bit of detail during this presentation about our technology, our pathway to market, some of the partnerships that we have established and what we're looking for. Next slide, please. So we were founded in late 2017 when our founders got together in the state of Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, which is a very fitting place. And in fact, the namesake, uh, Blue Nalu, Nalu is a Hawaiian term that literally means wave of the Moana or wave of the ocean. But in slang terms, to Nalu it also means to go with the flow and be mindful about your impact, uh, be mindful about what you put into your body, uh, be mindful about your impact on the community. Next slide, please. So our, our mission is really to be the global leader in cellular aquaculture uh, and produce the same great seafood products that consumers enjoy uh, in a uh, slightly different way. Um, and we do that essentially by isolating the specific muscle, fat, and connective tissue cells of a fish and scaling those up in a aseptic environment that we control. So the factory of the future essentially looks like a microbrewery with large stainless steel tanks. And inside those tanks are cells. So again, the muscle cells, fat cells, connective tissue cells, uh, that we are able to proliferate without any genetic modification whatsoever uh, by feeding them a mixture of nutrients, salts, minerals, amino acids, sugars, um, and other ingredients that a fish cell would need to grow, to be happy and healthy. And once we achieve a large enough volume, we extrude those cells into consumer product forms uh, that are recognizable, like a filet, like a, uh, uh, you know, a pokey uh, block, um, like a, um, a saku block. 
So lots of opportunities, um, and I'm happy to go into more detail. Uh, next slide, please. So we really have brought together a world-class team that would be required to commercialize our product uh, from food science, cell biology, engineering, next slide, please, uh, finance, legal, IP, uh, food safety, food quality assurance, regulatory, marketing, sales, next slide, please. And today we're just over 30 uh, team members. This time last year, we were 14, uh, we're over 30 today, and we'll be uh, closer to 60 by this time next year. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have brought together a great advisory team, including the former head of global R&D for PepsiCo and Campbell Soup. Uh, uh, Jacques-Yves uh, Cousteau is uh, youngest son. Uh, Pierre-Yves is on our advisory board, as well as the former head of marketing for the Food Network and the Cooking Channel, uh, as well as J.B. Kelly with the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation representing the U.S. Uh, but we're also a culinary forward company. Uh, so the president of the Culinary Institute of America, uh, as well as the founder of Roy's Restaurants, Roy Yamaguchi, are both on our advisory board, and Roy is a rest, is a investor as well. And I'll just highlight uh, some folks who, who some fo some folks w may recognize Dr. Jonathan Zohar at the University of Maryland, whom we're working very closely with as well. Next slide, please. So we're really all about uh, you know. Solving a challenge, you know, the global demand for seafood is at an all-time high and is anticipated to grow over the years ahead, especially as more consumers shift from red meat to seafood. Uh, Wild-caught uh, volumes have stayed flat since the mid-90s. Aquaculture has had a meteoric rise, uh, but still there is not enough supply to meet that demand. So we really see Blue Nalu as being a third option as providing the additional supply that is required to meet that growing demand in the year ahead. Next slide, please. Um, and we really uh, are focused on a number of different challenges that we, we can provide solutions. So for example, sourcing, you know, our products will have the same great taste and quality as conventional seafood, uh, but offered on a predictable, consistent supply year round without any seasonality. Uh, we are also transforming the supply chain, whereas today seafood may travel seven to 9,000 miles from uh, Indonesia to the US um, at great expense and a great carbon footprint, we can actually put factories close to the market and reduce that time, reduce that transport cost. In terms of personal health, our products will not have mercury or microplastics or other environmental contaminants that are increasingly found in the ocean. Uh, we control the process from end to end. So it's completely traceable with a well-documented food safety regimen. For food service, you know, we've talked with over 60 chefs and food service operators today um, who are very excited about this product because it's 100% yield. When they get a fish, they typically have to discard 40 to 60%, uh, or they can try to put it into a soup or some sort. Um, but the fact that our product is 100% yield with no bones, no heads, no tails, no scones, no, no, uh, no bones, no scales, also means that they're saving cost uh, and there's reduced labor and there's reduced risk of injury. They're no longer having to do so much knife work at the back of the house. For the retailers, you know, a lot of retailers, the, you know, there's a lot of tailwinds that are supporting this movement towards seafood sustainability. A number of retailers are making commitments to ASC, MSC, BAP certified products. Um, and I was talking recently with a leading retail grocery chain in Canada they have actually delisted certain species um, because of the sustainability concern. So that's an opportunity for Blue Nalu to come in and say, hey, you know, we can produce that species uh, and have it be sustainable with the proper third party independent verified certifications. So we're very excited to be talking with retail partners as well. Next slide, please. So in December last year, we actually held our premier culinary demonstration you know, in a very short amount of time, uh, we've been able to produce a proof of concept. And that's what this event really was. It was held in December last year here in San Diego along the waterfront at a iconic seafood restaurant. Uh, and our chef produced cell-based amberjack. So this was a yellowtail amberjack that was produced and it performs exactly the same uh, in terms of it could be served raw, it could be served in an acidified solution for ceviche, uh, it could be cooked in 350 degree Fahrenheit oil for a uh, batter breaded fried fish taco, you know, which is very popular here in San Diego as well. Um, and it was very well received. Next slide, please. 
Um, but you know, it's all about not small scale. From day one as a company, we've been focused on large scale production. You know, our CEO, Luke Cooperhouse, has 35 years in the food industry uh, and really got the company on a strong footing from day one, focused on how do we reduce cost? How do we produce at high volume? And how do we ship our product uh, and make our product available uh, everywhere in the world where seafood is consumed. And so this is actually a facility that we've taken over. Currently today, we're in 6,000 square feet. This is a 40,000 square foot facility in San Diego. Uh, this will be our global R&D administration uh, and pilot scale commercial production facility as part of our phase three of commercialization. Next slide, please. But this is our phase five commercialization. This is 150,000 square feet capable of producing 10 million pounds uh, or more per year of 100% yield finished seafood product. Uh, and this will be adapted for each market. So, you know, this, this factory could be producing uh, bluefin tuna, Chilean sea bass, red snapper, mahi mahi, uh, all four of those, or it could be producing just one species, totally demand driven. Whereas today the seafood industry is very much supply driven. Next slide, please. So we're looking to, we're preparing for global expansion and this is just a demonstration of the types of markets that we will be entering. Uh, and we're looking for partners within each market to help us understand the regulatory landscape, to understand the sales uh, and marketing channels, to understand the consumer appetite, what species, what product forms, uh, what price points, what messaging, how do we brand this? Uh, and we're also looking to partner with iconic brands uh, to help introduce Blue Nalu to the market. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip this one today, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so far to date, we've raised $24.5 million through our seed round and A round investments. We've brought on several strategic investors, including Nutreco, the world's, one of the world's largest aquaculture feed companies. They own a division called Scredding, Griffith Foods uh, on product development, rich products on marketing and sales, Pull Moan out of Korea. Uh, that has operations, sales, marketing, and regulatory expertise, and Sumitomo Corporation out of Japan, which has a very similar set of expertise. Next slide, please. Uh, we absolutely do align with the sustainable development goals. These are the 10 that we've identified that we identi identify with. Next slide, please. But obviously, we're focused on SDG 14, which is life below water. And uh, we have actually launched a education platform called Eat Blue. So I encourage everybody to go to Eat dot blue www.eat.blue to learn more about uh, ocean health human health animal welfare and the blue economy uh, this is a platform of ambassadors globally uh, who see opportunity who see a, a new way forward and we're proud to support them and uh, kudos to shara on the team a team for helping us put this together as well next slide please so I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we really see Blue Nalu as a, uh, a global solution to partner with the seafood industry, uh, provide species that you know typically are imported or cannot be farmed. So we're not looking to compete with the conventional seafood industry. We're looking to uh, complement and supplement the supply. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. Uh, three great presentations, I think, that also show the breadth of this aquaculture industry, and if you throw in biomarine, you know, much, much even broader. So great opportunities, great presentations. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kim uh, for the Q&A. Wonderful, all right. So uh, I echo Michael, these were wonderful presentations. Um, I always love learning from these creative, innovative minds and companies, what you guys are working on. Um, we can do science all day long, but if there's not somebody to actually take that science and do something with it, um, it's all kind of a moot point. So thank you for what you guys are doing. Um, so it's very clear that you guys are all working on really important innovations that are not just going to help propel responsible marine aquaculture forward, but also the bigger picture of food and energy production to help society meet the needs of a growing population in a changing climate. Um, before uh, we turn it over to the audience, I want to ask you guys kind of a few bigger picture questions. Um, and so for this first question, I'm going to ask you, and I know this is hard for all of us to do, but I'm going to ask you just to choose one because um, we know that there are many, um, but what would you say 
is the biggest obstacle or challenge that you're facing for moving these innovations forward? And so, Greg, we're actually going to start with you. Um, so, so if you had to choose just one obstacle or challenge that Blue Nalo is facing in getting this, you know, exciting cell-based technology out there, what would it be? Uh, thanks, Kim. Um, it's, it has to be scalability, and that's why from day one we've been focused on that challenge uh, as a company. Uh, there's about 50 companies globally in the cell-based food space, whether it's meat, pork, poultry, seafood, foie gras, swim bladders, um, you know, uh, collagen, you, have, you name it. Uh, and every single one of these companies has to deal with the challenge of scalability. Uh, and we believe we've we developed a strategy to move forward. And Eliza, how about you? For the seaweed sector, what would you say is the biggest obstacle or challenge that you guys are facing right now? Currently for a work in California, that would have to be regulations um, because the challenge associated with seaweed aquaculture and aquaculture in general in the US um, is that it's not really well understood. Um, so within the context of the work that we're doing under the ARPA e Mariner program, we've been struggling for the last 10 months or so to work with the regulatory agencies in order to even begin to submit a permit application uh, that will allow us to conduct the demonstration project um, off the coast of the U.S. And so that, that disconnect and that lack of understanding amongst the regulators and really lack of a clear pathway uh, forward is one of the, the issues that we're most currently dealing with right now. And can I just ask as a follow-up, do you see a difference in those regulatory hurdles between your operations in the Faroe Islands and your operations off the coast of California? Yes, a little bit in terms of the operation. Since the operation in the Faroe Islands has been going on for the last decade or so, um, there's more understanding of the potential opportunity and value for seaweed cultivation. Um, so we were actually successful. We submitted a series of permits, uh, permit applications late last year. Um, four different sites in the Faroe Islands, and all of those were approved um, just because the regulatory agencies there understand uh, really op the, the opportunity that's associated with seaweed cultivation. Um, and really that that application process represented the first, well, the first initiative, so I should caveat this, and that it's, it's a very new development that the uh, Faroe's uh, company or branch of the company has been able to secure those permits. Um, but in the, in the United States, that the, the development of the industry just hasn't happened yet um, to the extent to which there's a lot of confusion um, and uncertainty within the regulators, um, regulatory agencies as to how to move forward. So there is a little bit of a difference, at least between our operations in the Faroe Islands and the U.S., um, but more generally, regulations and, and the, the permitting process is going to be challenging um, in many parts of the world. So that would be what I would think is the biggest challenge that we're currently wrestling with. And Luis, how about you? What is one of the biggest challenges or obstacles that Sparos is facing specifically for your Feednetics program? I think you're on mute. Uh, sorry for that. I think our biggest challenge is um, is on uh, on uh, changing a little the mindset of the people working operational in fish farms in, in aquafeed uh, companies, because I mean uh, even even if we are increasingly getting used to use IT tools in our uh, personal lives, in professional life it's still not. Uh, the people are still not used. Uh, I st still not used to it. There is some resistance from uh, farm managers, from uh, from the technical managers at uh, at, uh, at aqua, aqua feed companies to use such a tool on a on a daily basis, on a regular basis. So, but so, the, but I think it's coming, and we are making progress. Our we don't have the sales where we expected them to be, or we that had hoped for, but we are progressing there, and I think it's coming. There is interest. But people don't know very well yet how to use these tools. So we have to do this work. <laughs> so it sounds like there's kind of a common theme here with you and Eliza in that it's kind of about education at different levels. So for you, it's the education of the farmers and regulators and the value that this type of tool can bring for addressing perceptions. So for Eliza, it's educating you know, the regulatory agencies um, that work on this, correct? Yes, education and training, I would say, yes. And so, you know, you mentioned um, these challenges, which, you know, 
we, we've heard over and over for various aspects of growing and expanding green aquaculture responsibly, um, and certainly also for food and energy production, um, blue economy development. Um, so then what needs to happen then for innovators like yourselves to succeed? How can we overcome some of these hurdles? And Luis, since we had you last, last time we'll have you um, answer this one first. Um, if you could pick, if, if you were kind of the puppet master and controlling everything, what would be the first thing that you would make happen to help your company succeed? What would be the first thing? That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> Or what's the main thing that needs to happen to help you succeed? I mean, the, as uh, I mean, the um, the I mean, of course, the the big challenge uh, our days we all know it's uh, we have this this uh, pandemic which is affecting all all of us, and um, I mean, and for instance, I mean, uh, I say that our challenge was uh, uh, providing training uh, to people and uh, and explaining how the how they can benefit from our tool. Um, of course, I mean, we have the different plans for this, but this all had to be adjusted. And basically, what we're doing at the moment is a series of uh, webinars and uh, and uh, this uh, this type of uh, this type of uh, event that's what we can do at the moment but um, i mean i i believe that uh, i mean communication it's uh, it it is uh, it is uh, our uh, what we have to do and i mean then we have to find different ways to communicate uh, what our, i mean our uh, our products and our uh, and uh, I mean and also and that's a problem that I think we have in general for the aquaculture industry. Uh, it's also the the image of the industry. I mean that's something that we have to work with the with the public. I mean of course we know that we have sustainability uh, challenges and I mean and uh, be it uh, our uh, our software, uh, Greg's uh, product or uh, Eliza's uh, macroalgae. I think th those are all part of the solution to explain the public that aquaculture can have a very positive impact on the on their lives and that uh, I mean of course there are environmental impacts but this can be mitigated and that's what we have to and we are doing it in different ways. By growing macroalgae, by developing software, or by making cellular-based uh, products. So, I'm happy to be here with the with the with the with the three of you. <laughs> Great, and and Greg, how about you? If if you had control and you could choose, you know, one solution to help propel Blue Nalu forward, um, what would that solution be? Uh, similar to Luis's comment. Uh, you know, maybe instead of a silver bullet, I think we all are working towards a similar goal, which is uh, solutions for the planet, solutions for humanity, solutions for human health. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, you know, we're, we're, we're really excited about the shift towards seafood. Uh, more and more consumers reducing the amount of red meat that they might consume uh, towards a more healthy, balanced diet with seafood as a staple. Um, and so we, we, we're happy to be able to support that shift uh, with increased supply on a predictable, consistent basis. Um, you know, and you know, I guess if I had my druthers, uh, you know, more funding, uh, more talent, um, all the, all the above. And Eliza, uh, last word on this: <laughs> what, what would your ideal solution be to help Rayforest propel your initiatives forward, specifically this project that you have with the DOE? Um, the microsystems, the macro systems. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it builds off of the answer that both of you have already given, um, but also tying back to the, the challenge on regulators um, and the regulatory barriers that we're currently facing. Um, another really critical component just of agricultural development in general in the United States seems to be improved um, public education and really building those social licenses um, across all variety of existing industries. And one of the things Ocean Rainforest is really working towards um, and would appreciate any in advice or um, guidance that uh, either all of you have to offer or anyone in the audience um, in terms of really how to engage the local community um, to make it clear that aquaculture, it does present this really unique opportunity for sustainable biomass production in all variety of aspects of food or animal feed or biofuels or things like that. Um, and, and making it clear that there's a way for not only, well, there's a way for us to complement these existing industries um, or existing marine industries by working in specifically the seaweed aquaculture space. 
So building that, that social license and a general education and, and understanding of what we're trying to do, why it could be beneficial for the local community, um, I think would be really helpful, especially as we look um, toward the next three years and working in the United States. And it, it's part of what we're, we intend to do, but um, that, that will just be another critical component of really helping advance the industry in the months and years ahead. And, and this is a challenge, and this is something that the aquarium has been um, working really hard on. Um, so I, it's unfortunate that I'm hearing you guys say that perceptions is still such a roadblock, but um, you know, I guess it's job security for me because that's what we're doing. <laughs> so happy to help. Um, so now I want to open it up. So I'm hoping some of you in the audience have some great questions for our panelists. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so we have one for Eliza. Um, this is from Hemming. Uh, have you been in touch with anyone in Norway working on this? Yes, um, I had the opportunity to work to speak with a number of individuals in Norway working um, in sustainable uh, seaweed production. As the company is based in the Faroe Islands, Oliver Gregerson, who's the CEO and managing director of the company, has maintained a very active communication uh, with a number of individuals in the Norwegian seaweed uh, production space. So. Absolutely on it um, with that that connection, and, and grateful to be at least to have part of our work um, be able to be so directly connected to that that part of the world. And we have a question for Luis from KC Stover. Um, can Feednetics predict interactions of feed composition and feed quantities at various temperature regimes? Uh, thank you uh, for that question. Um, yes, uh, actually, that's uh, we believe that that's one of the strong points of Feednetics because it can r really not just uh, it can easily predict interactions of different factors of the different of the different inputs, let's say, and that includes the feed composition, the feed quantities, and also the water temperature, which is a major drive for the uh, for uh, fish growth and for feed utilization, as we as we know it. So yes, uh, the short answer is yes, it can, and we believe that's one of the strong points. And from Tak Yang Lee, uh, this is for Greg. How does this company, or how does this compare with conventional seafood in terms of sustainability? Uh, great, great question, Tak. Um, so the short answer is we have a lot more work to do in collecting data. Uh, we're still at such a small scale, uh, but the real purpose of the next facility is to have enough scale in order to properly analyze the inputs and conduct a life cycle analysis. Uh, but conceptually, we are very excited about the sustainability message because, you know, our products are 100% yield. So there's no longer any bycatch from the wild caught. Um, there's no longer any spoilage in transport. Um, you, know, you know, theoretically, our shelf life is longer because we start with a plate count of bacteria at zero, whereas maybe uh, conventional seafood, conventional fish might have you know, you know, other bacteria that would contaminate the product. Um, so for these reasons, we, you know, we reduce food waste, um, reduce the amount of uh, inputs that are required uh, to produce a product that is the same as what is currently on the market that consumers demand. And Greg, I actually have a follow-up question to that. So you mentioned in your presentation about certifications. Are there any certification bodies that are currently looking at cell-based food production? Definitely, yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, so the, actually one of the founders of the Aquaculture Stewardship Council is now the director of sustainability at Nutreco. Uh, and we've been working with them for, a lot, for, for many months and we're you know, we're developing a strategy for how does a certification body see Blue Nalu, whether it's, you know, Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, which is more of a ratings or, uh, you know, uh, rubric, uh, or a third party independent, you know, uh, audited certification standard. Um, it may be a hybrid, so still some work to do, but ultimately it's got to be a stakeholder driven process uh, with many people involved and it won't take, you know, it'll, it'll take many years to get there. But the conversations are underway. Correct. Okay. And okay, so uh, from Marine Bioenergy Inc. This is for Eliza. Um, thank you for your great presentation. Um, giant kelp is a fast grow is fast growing, which is valuable. Can the farm system also support other species if they become profitable? Thank you for the question, Marine Bioenergy. Um, I will imagine that this is 
of IMTA or Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture. Um, so I'm going to frame it in that way. Um, mostly what we're doing in terms of the Macrosystems project is specifically for seaweed cultivation. Um, and the reason for that is we've identified seaweed cultivation in large scale uh, cultivate, or cultivation techniques as being the most efficient way of producing significant quantities of biomass. And yes, there would definitely be value, especially at a smaller scale, um, in incorporating additional types of aquaculture. So mussels, shellfish, um, things of that nature would actually absolutely make sense at a small scale. Um, but what really the Macrosystems project is looking for is developing these very large scale systems that would be able to produce massive quantities of biomass to then be funneled for animal feed or biofuel or industries that really need a, a lot of biomass. Um, so because of that, and just for ease of harvesting as well, um, as soon as you incorporate other marine organisms into that structure, you're going to complicate harvesting efforts. Um, so we are specifically focused on, or exclusively focused on giant kelp cultivation, given kind of the large scale um, a vision associated with the project. But I'd be happy to speak more with you um, about that at some point offline. And uh, Eliza, one thing I don't know that you touched upon, but I was looking at your website. You guys are also looking into, and I forget what species it is, um, as the substitute for cow uh, feed, right? To reduce the methane emissions from um, cows. Yes, and so the species that has kind of captured the news uh, media and journalists' attention over the course of the last few months um, is Asparagopsis taxiformis, um, which another company actually uh, that I believe will be joining us at the follow-up um, presentation in Blue Tech Week. Um, but they're really focused on Asparagopsis, which has shown significant reduction in methane when fed to cows. Um, what Ocean Rainforest is more specifically focused on is the opportunity to use uh, fermented or ensiled seaweed uh, to reduce methane emissions. And so we've done uh, preliminary trials all um, in Denmark and the Faroe Islands and have seen significant success of this incorporation of fermented seaweed into animal feed and then a subsequent reduction of methane from cows. Um, it's not the same as the, the tagline of 90, 99% emissions, which some of you may be familiar with from Asparagopsis, um, but it does show meaningful reduction. And so in that way, um, what we would be doing in terms of the animal feed um, and supplying that um, the biomass as a way to offset methane emissions is mostly for, focused on the fermentation, which is a technique that Ocean Rainforest and the Faroe Islands has um, refined over the course of the last few years and then we'll continue um, to explore as we work in California. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that all of this is early in the science stages, right? So even these 99% <laughs> claims we have to be careful with because happening in a lab versus in real life. Um, so do we, do we have other questions? Yes, okay, Tamara Khan. So this is for Luis. Um, can Feednetics predict the effects of feeds or feeding on fish nutritional value, aka omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, etc.? I think you're on mute again. Sorry. Yes, I, uh, yes, I didn't go into detail into that. But actually, Feednetics can predict uh, the, the fish uh, um, the carcass composition, so in terms of uh, fat, protein, and uh, fatty acids. So if we feed, we know that we f if we feed um, the, the fish with the feed rich in uh, omega-3 fatty acids, like uh, DHA, we know that this will tend to reflect in the fish uh, fillet. Uh, and this is something that we can simulate in Fignetics, not just uh, that it does, we know that it does, but you can reflect how much it, uh, it will accumulate in the, in, the, in the fish fillet, which has obvious uh, benefits for, the, for human health, as we know. For the vitamins and minerals, the answer is no, because, I mean, to be able to simulate the content of minerals and uh, vitamins, we would have to know much more about uh, mineral and vitamin metabolism by the fish than what we know today, because uh, what we can encapsulate in the model, in the algorithm, is our knowledge. And uh, for vitamin and for fatty acids, amino acids, we know a lot. For um, vitamins and minerals, we know much less. When we know more, then eventually we can update the algorithm with that. And we do know that omega-3 fatty acids are super important for human health, um, heart and brain health. Um, I wish I had more this morning. <laughs> Uh, so great. Um, what about the yuck factor? Um, there must be an element of overcoming people's established attitudes toward uh, 
food, fi fish, right? That's how they phrase it. I'm guessing they're meaning attitudes toward food that's made in a lab. <laughs> we get this question all the time, so I, I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, Tamara. Um, yeah, I, I would say careful what, uh, you know, if you really want, you know, just be careful what you ask for, because a lot of the food that people consume is not well understood how it's how it's produced. Um, but we definitely are very excited. You know, it's a, you know, our cells that we're growing, um, they naturally want to grow, right? So all we're doing is we're aiding their natural tendency. So it's, um, and it's done, like I said, in an aseptic environment. So uh, there's less bacteria, there's, there's, you know, limited chance of, of pathogens. There's, you know, from a food safety perspective, um, it's quite a bit, um, you know, better than some of the other foods that are on the market. So certainly like anything in life, when there's a new innovation, um, you know, when the microwave was first introduced, people had a little bit of a difficulty figuring out, oh, I'm going to put this food in a box, take it out and it's warm. Um, you know, just like with many food innovations, it takes time for sure. Uh, but some of our consumer research that we've done, um, you know, tells us that there is a strong desire for people to have an opportunity to taste the product. You know, at the end of the day, our, our product has to taste and perform the same. So if it does meet that minimal threshold, uh, we've heard and have seen consumers uh, be more willing to uh, first to try it and then ultimately adopt it in greater, uh, greater volumes. Thank you. Any more questions? I think we're actually we almost out of time. One more? One more quick Sorry. question, if there is one. So I get the impression that we have uh, answered all their questions. So uh, Kim and the three presenters, you guys have done an amazing job. Uh, Eliza, thank you so much for mentioning that you and this other company that you talked about will be at Blue Tech Week. Um, last year we had, uh, I think, 150 companies from around the world. And the kinds of companies that are presenting today, and the uh, and many more, uh, will be at Blue Tech Week because we're not a, we don't produce a trade show. Uh, we are a networking organization, and our goal is basically to bring great companies together with uh, potential partners around the world. Um, and so here you've had three wonderful companies as part of our monthly Blue Tech Global Connect uh, webinar series. Our biggest series of events is Blue Tech Week coming up soon. If you have not taken this information, um, uh, you might want to take a screenshot quickly of that. Um, but all of these people are accessible as they have made as they have made clear today. And within about a day, you will find their videos up on our TMA Blue Tech YouTube channel. So again, three great presentations. Uh, I hope you will join us uh, for Blue Tech Week. For those that are focused on um, ocean sciences, Tuesday, uh, the 17th of November, is um, uh, we will do in conjunction with with uh, Scripps Institution Oceanography. Wednesday, Thursday is our Blue Tech Summit and Tech Expo. And then Friday, for the first time, we're looking uh, at more of a policy angle for the state of California and the national level. Um, we want to thank all of you for participating. Please join up, uh, join uh, Blue Tech Week. You can see it there, bluetechweek.org. Um, also, look forward to upcoming events. Uh, the Ocean Cleanup will be in January uh, 21st of 2021. Uh, and then I want to thank our sponsors and partners. You can see on the upper right uh, the Blue Tech Cluster Alliance, which is our, which is 10 leading clusters from eight countries around the world. They often help us source companies, and it is really a wonderful grouping of companies that are organizations we've been able to bring together. Together we reach thousands of companies. Uh, I want to thank the Brink uh, at the University of San Diego, which has been rated the number one accelerator in San Diego. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say if uh, we're looking for sponsorship opportunities both for Blue Tech Week but also for this uh, Global Connect series. Special thanks to uh, the Aquarium of the Pacific, Long Beach, uh, for uh, helping us today. Uh, Kim, your great comments to begin with and 
for moderating today. Uh, it's really been a delight over the years to work with the aquarium, and, and uh, we're thrilled that today we could do this. And hopefully we'll see you at Blue Tech Week, uh, Tesparo's Ocean Rainforest, uh, Blue Nalu, and then Fortemociano is the one, is our partner in, through the Blue Tech Cluster Alliance in uh, Portugal that introduced us to Spato, and I think it shows uh, kind of the, the strength of collaboration. So thanks to all of you, thanks to the TMA Blue Tech team, all uh, shown here, um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in uh, less than a month at Blue Tech Week. Uh, and then back in January at our next uh, Blue Tech Global Connect. And please be in touch with our great companies, and let's make a wonderful progress together, protecting this earth, uh, promoting sustainability, promoting the circular economy. So many thanks to all of you, and stay safe, stay well, and we hope to see you next month at uh, Blue Tech Week. Thanks a lot.